have some powerful texts this morning. As we heard them read to us just a moment ago. And so I'm going to just touch on them quickly before we go to John. Acts 16 gives us uh, the outlook of the story, the great story of Paul and Silas as they're taking God's message that God has given them and they're going and preaching and they're being harassed. What makes that such a great story? What makes it a great story is if you read it again, like Kathy read it to us just a moment ago, read it again and look for the results of even the harassment that they receive because by the end it turns into an opportunity for salvation for the jailer who, had, uh, who held them captive, who thought his own life was going to be in danger, and yet he came to the Lord and his whole family, it says, was baptized. But before that, we're not going to talk more about that, before that Paul and Silas are being harassed, harassed by a fortune-telling woman child who had a spirit. And Paul goes and prays over her and releases that spirit from her. And her owners, yes, her owners, because she was a slave, used lies and distortion and all kinds of other means to, to bring the, the, the people of that time into a frenzy uh, and, and with the lies and the distortion, they get Paul and Silas arrested. Why do they get them arrested? Because without her special gift, they couldn't earn any more money off of her. See, they were using her and this special gift for their own benefit. I wish today we could stop and say, well, those kinds of lies and distortions are a thing of the past. But today we know that those are still in our midst and in our community. Uh, I'm not speaking about Pembroke Pines even, but I'm talking about the wider sense of community than that. Lies and distortions that still exist and unfortunately exist among so many who, are, uh, who call themselves Christians. I read a story just yesterday afternoon, it came across on Facebook, about a young woman in South Carolina who had been in an accident. This young woman was handicapped, and while she waited for a tow truck on the side of the road, finally the tow truck driver arrived, and you know what he did? He refused to tow her car citing his Christian principles that he lived by because she had political stickers on the back of her car for a candidate that he wasn't supporting. Hmm? He says that he didn't know she was handicapped, though she had the placard for handicapped in her car, but he says even if he had known that she was handicapped, he would not have told her. I wonder this day, how do we get to a point in this country where our political rhetoric trumps our faith identity, who we are? I, I, I don't know if you, when you read articles on, uh, and on online, Facebook or other places, you know, at the bottom there's always room for comments, and some of those comments get real nasty real quick, and sometimes you just have to ignore them, but I read one comment that I thought was very appropriate, one person who, who quoted, he quoted uh, J. Christ, slash in the New Testament, saying, as you do to the least of my brethren, so you do unto me. And this person who put that quote there wrote underneath, maybe one day he'll get to explain face to face to Jesus what part of that command he didn't understand. Do we have that right to turn somebody away because their political, uh, their political uh, preference is different than ours? We need to move carefully in this day and age so as not to fall into those kinds of traps. But life has been like that these days. Walk with me quickly to Revelation 22. 
the last chapter of the last book of what we call the Christian Bible. Now, I have to point out to you, if you looked in your, in your um, Celebrate and, and saw where the, the readings were, are, it's like a whole bunch of numbers. You know what those numbers are for? Because there are verses that are left out of our reading this morning. We've left out some verses. And, and I wonder what the people who chose the lectionary were thinking when they left out verses 18 and 19. Do you know what verses 18 and 19 say? It says, don't leave out or add anything to this word. <laughs> and the, those are the verses they left out. <laughs> because the word in itself is already a whole. Don't leave anything out. Don't add anything to it. Because if you do, if you do then these things will happen to you as well. So go figure. I don't know what they were thinking, but yet we get a picture this morning from Revelation 22. We get a picture of God who is there with all those who have carried the name of God proudly, who have not fallen back without shame, and now they are in the presence, the comforting presence of God. Here at the end of the story, the end of salvation history, the truth is there's another verse left out, that's verse 15. I don't know why they left so many verses out. Pick and choose? You can't pick and choose. Verse 15 tells you that those who don't walk with the name of God, who don't walk with the mark of Christ upon their forehead, what happens to them? And it's not good. It talks about their fate for those who don't carry God's name proudly, so we should take note. Study those texts in their wholeness, friends. Don't, don't read just the little parts. And someday, as somebody studies that, maybe somebody will come and say, Pastor, we, we need a Bible study on the book of Revelation because there's so much there that needs to be unpacked and, and, and taken apart so we can understand what's going on. Maybe we will. But all of those things serve to set the tone for us about what life is like. There is so much that is uncertain, there is so much uh, discord, there are so many different things going on, that when we get to the Gospel, John 17, that we, we see in the Gospel here a picture of life. The real, true picture of life that Jesus gives us, a life that corresponds <laughs> to our own life and existence, right? Because most of us are not walking uh, on just this beautiful surface where everything is just, uh, you know, just always works out exactly the way we want to, right? I, I mean, is there anybody here who has had that experience, right? I, I mean, we go through troubles, we go through problems, we go through situations, whether it's at work or, or in the community or even in our family. We have things that are going on, and it's sometimes good for us to read the Bible and say, you know, there were things going on in the day of the Bible as well. It wasn't that just because Jesus came into our lives that everything turned into a, a, a cakewalk, huh? That, that things actually became harder for the people of God, and, uh, and sometimes dangerous, and, and sometimes our own lives are like that. We, we're frightened. We don't know what's going to happen next. We, we may be realizing that things are unfair, that they're overwhelming, and we don't know where to turn. But John 17 is a good place to turn. Because here in John 17, we find Jesus praying. Praying for his disciples. But praying actually, and I'm going to even go as far as saying, by name, for each one of us. Isn't that a powerful thing? To go through life and to realize that Jesus recognizes us, you and me, Kelly, that God is praying, that Jesus is praying for you. Huh? And that Jesus is speaking to each one of us and is taking time and wanting the best for us. Look at what he is praying. He is praying for us as he has already earlier in the chapter been praying for all the disciples that they would take all that they had learned, all that he has taught them, all that he has given them, praying that they would know of God's overwhelming love and care and support for them in the midst of it all, in the midst of whatever is going on. But then there's more. He also prays for those who will 
yet believe. Those who will hear the testimony of his disciples, who will, and those who will hear the testimonies of those who heard the testimony from the disciples, and who heard the, and you see how that goes on and on, and it goes through the generations, it goes through time, it goes through space, through continents, all the way until it gets to right where you and I are today. Because somebody who heard that testimony shared it also with you. Maybe it was your parents, maybe it was your pastor, maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a stranger on the street. But nonetheless, God sent someone to tell you the same story and to share that story who passed it on from one who had come before them. And so when I was preparing the sermon, I was writing, it's, it's like we were sitting at the table. And then I took out and said, you know what? It's not even an analogy. We are sitting at the table. We are sitting at the table with Jesus and with those first disciples and with all those who have come since then and with all those who are yet to come whom we haven't even had the opportunity to meet or think about or imagine. We are all sitting at the table together, and Jesus is specifically including us in his prayers. Barbara Lundblad. Mike, that's a name that you know, I think. Right? Barbara Lundblad is a Lutheran pastor, professor at Union Theological Seminary for many years in New York City, where, of course, I had my first call as well. She's very much part of telling the story. As I recall it, she uh, used to tell the story also to a, a young seminary student who is now a pastor up in Boston. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that pastor in Boston we heard about yesterday quite a bit because our MC kept referring to how she had made him a grandfather. Um, <laughs> that baby's and, nine uh, days old. So the story goes forward. <laughs> she was telling the story. Barbara Lundblad was telling the story. Heidi is telling the story. Even though I know Heidi heard it from many places, not just from, from Barbara. She heard it from mom and dad long before Barbara Lundblad. But I can tell you that I heard from Barbara Lundblad as well when I was a young pastor in New York. <clears throat> And she had times when she would meet with the pastors and share with us images that were in the scriptures for preaching. And, and she would lift up images that, that we would be able to, to take in a new way and present to the people of God to tell the story. Because that's what she was all about. That's what she would do. She would tell the story so that we also could go forward and tell the story. She writes a commentary about this passage of John 17 in a way that opens up these new images, the images that are already there, but opens them up in a new way. And she said that Jesus is praying for the disciples and for those who would come later for us just the same way that a mother would pray for her children. The same way that a mother prays for her family that she would pray that they would be one, that they would be united, that they would come together and see the vision, and seeing the vision that they would share it with others, and that they would live it out so that others might come to know that vision as well. Jesus, she said, is like a mother who has, has adopted us as children and calls us as disciples and prays with a motherly heart. Have you ever encountered a mother praying for her children? Maybe it's your mother. Maybe you know yourself to be that mother for your children. And on this Mother's Day, when we recognize that um, so many forces have moved to make Mother's Day one more commercial opportunity to sell what flowers and chocolate and, and, and restaurants and all those things, do we stop some, at some moment and say, what is it really all about? Because Mother's Day really is all about, in its initiation, in its beginning, about mothers praying for their families. Julia, 
um, how Ward, Ward Howe rather, uh, had a prayer in her heart back in 1870. That's when it first began. And she had a prayer in her heart that there would be a special day set aside that she didn't call Mother's Day, but Mother's Peace Day. And here's what she wrote. I'm going to read this for you. She said, Arise, all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears, say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage, asking for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn what we have been able to teach them, teach them of charity and mercy and patience. We women of one country will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor nor violence indicate possession. Friends, it is the prayer of a mother who has seen devastation taking place and who wants for her own family and all families to be able to come together in a moment of peace and justice to work together for a vision where all God's children would be honored and cared for and respected. And so Barbara Lemblatt says that this Jesus who prays for us, this Jesus who in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, is called the Word, the Word that was from the beginning, the Word that was with us and is with us, the Logos that is God, that Jesus is this Logos. And she points out that the word Logos that we see in the Greek is equivalent to the Hebrew word that is translated as Sophia. It means wisdom. Sophia was the co-creator with God of all that we see, a powerful force along with as part of God. And so Barbara Lovelack asked the question, could it be that the spirit that moved over the waters in creation <coughs> became a mothering presence to the, in the Gospel of John? She says, when we argue that God can only be called Father, we hear Jesus <coughs> praying as a mother, worried about her children. I will not leave you orphaned, he says. You are my own, and I will be with you forever. And so Jesus remains with us. And like a good mother, prays for us <coughs> that we might know the will and the spirit and the power of God in our lives, and that we would carry that on even forward, just like our mothers already do. May we walk knowing and being that kind of mother, praying for one another, and taking care of the redemption of the whole world. It's in our hands with Jesus at our side. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs>